Welcome to the speaker series of the Snohomish County Transportation Coalition. I'm Brock Howell, Executive Director of SnowTrack. Today, SnowTrack is excited to host Melanie Troon, Tim Tim Chan, and Jessica Roberts to discuss the future of commute trip reduction and transportation demand management. As a mobility management coalition, SnowTrack advocates for connecting people and communities in Snohomish County and beyond with safe, equitable, and accessible transportation by bringing together transportation and human service providers to identify mobility gaps and opportunities. SnowTrack focuses especially on the needs of people with disabilities, older adults, youth, and low-income individuals, as well as people of color, immigrants and refugees, veterans, tribal nations, veterans, and rural communities. With our speaker series, we hope to inspire leaders and advocates with best practices from around the country and world. So I cannot be more pleased to have Melanie, Tim Tim, and Jessica join us here today. Each panelist will provide about a 10 minute presentation and we'll have Q&A at the end. So be sure to think of your questions throughout the presentations and please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat now. Let's get this bus rolling. First, a quick definition of terms. Transportation demand management, or TDM, refers to programs and projects that aim to provide more competitive, trans, uh, more competitive transportation options to driving alone, reduce trips, and improve traffic congestion without building more roads. These projects use techniques like education, rewards, and disincentives to reduce the need for vehicle trips, reduce the distance of trips, shift to more efficient transportation modes like transit and other forms of ride sharing. And often um, it's required through city mandated transportation demand management programs on new development and major institutions in order to address parking constraints and congestion. Often employers and building managers are mandated to partner with a local transportation management association, such as Commute Seattle, Move Redmond, Bellevue's TransManage, and Tacoma's Downtown on the go to ensure effective implementation of TDM strategies. Snohomish County does not currently have a TMA. Commute trip reduction or CTR is a subset of TDM. CTR programs, which are required by state law here in the state, aim to reduce carbon emissions and traffic congestion on the state's busiest commute routes by requiring work sites with 100 or more full-time employees who begin their shift between 6 and 9 a.m. on weekdays in the nine most populous counties in the state to develop and manage TDM programs in alignment with locally adopted goals for reducing vehicle trips and miles traveled. Work sites conduct commute trip reduction surveys every other year to measure vehicle miles traveled and other mode choices of their employees. WashDOT and jurisdictions use the survey results to report on collective progress toward drive alone and vehicle miles traveled reduction targets. Here in Snohomish County, Community Transit and Everett Transit oversee the implementation of CTR programs at our major employers. So um, first up, and I'm gonna stop my share here, to present is Melanie. Um, just a second while I figure things out on my end. Melanie is a senior associate at Nelson Nygaard, where she focuses on TDM development and implementation. Prior to Nelson Nygaard, she established marketing and incentive programs for commuters working in the Lloyd District of Portland, Oregon. Melanie serves as a member of the WashDOT TDM Executive Board. Melanie, take it away. Hey, everyone. Um, as Brock said, I focus on TDM um, with Nelson Nygaard. I'm a senior associate. I do a lot of work with law employers and their commute programs, and that is what I'm going to focus on today um, in the changes that we're seeing kind of pre-pandemic and post-pandemic and how that affects everyone. Um, bear with me. I have a lot of information, and I am not the best at screen share, so let's try this together. Um, but it'll be good no matter what, right, because we all like TDM. Um, let's see if this works. Oh, you can, can you see my notes or can you see my presentation? We can see your notes at the moment. Yeah. Do you guys want the inside scoop? Okay, <laughs> give me one second. I tried this before and I knew it wasn't gonna work. Okay. 
How's that? Better? Perfect. Okay, awesome. Um, all right, so as I said, lots of it, workplace employer programs that we're gonna talk about, Brock touched on a little bit of it. Um, but let's chat a little bit about what employer programs were prior to the pandemic. So as Brock mentioned, they, were, they are really focused on 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and essentially managing the demand of parking facilities and the congestion flow of traffic. Um, most of you, I think, are Washington-based, if not all. We know that that's very top of mind in the Puget Sound region, specifically Seattle. Um, still very top of mind, but I think the big change is that in the previous world, everyone assumed that everyone was working those nine to five hours on site and they were coming to work four to five days per week. Um, this created a lot of demand in a very short period of time um, with a focus on a really specific type of trip and a really specific route to those locations. Um, we did see kind of pre-pandemic, the underlying goal of using these commute programs to improve employee experience and aid in recruitment and retention. So things like shuttle programs, sub subsidized transit, et cetera, were, were more than just to manage um, commuting, it was also a way to attract and retain employees for a lot of uh, large companies in the Puget Sound and beyond. Um, that all changed kind of in March 2020, when both work and commuting changed as we all know it. Um, the first thing that we kind of surfaced in this, this process was that um, essential workers still had to come to the office. And they had to deal with a lot of complications during that early pandemic time, like reductions in transit service, high cost of commuting, remaining parking prices, et cetera. Um, they were left kind of without the existing infrastructure that was supporting them because a lot of programs had shut down. Um, we also see that as we've progressed kind of through and after the pandemic, costs are continuing to increase related to gas, food, uh, food costs. Uh, child care, et cetera. So it is impacting a lot of folks that are working those hourly service jobs that are still required to come in to the office where a lot of white collar workers don't have to anymore. And we'll touch on that in a second. Um, hybrid work was the next big change. So a lot of the big companies where folks do a lot of computer work, let that happen and saw continued productivity. Um, and now I think there was a lot of expectation that everyone would be back in the office all the time by this point, but it's hasn't been the state and now the question is will we ever go back how often will we go back and how will people make that work is there going to be enforcement like what are the sticks and carrots that folks will be able to actually leverage to bring employees back into the offices um so the flexible work impacts everyone who's commuting and kind of traveling throughout the day in the prior world when we had those 6 a.m to 9 a.m peak periods five days a week it was a really defined rush hour um, really clear when the roads would be congested. That has changed. So the peak period has definitely grown in size, you know, 30 or two in some regions. That has an effect for anyone who's traveling during those times, adding increased peak periods to transit or roadways. Um, we also see a high concentration of employees commuting to offices on one to two days a week, sometimes three. The chart on the right is a, a graph from 2022 showing the popular days in the office. It was Tuesday, Wednesday. I think now we're seeing a little more Tuesday, Thursday. Again, really dependent on region and employers, but it is sparking congestion more on days, um, peak days of the week. And it's worse than, in some places, it's worse than, worse than what it was prior to the pandemic because people are choosing to drive alone frequently or take other trips other than commuting during those time periods in their personal vehicles. Um, we're also seeing the hybrid workers having increased justification to pay higher rates for parking. Um, they're only commuting a couple times a week. The return on investment and their time is more valuable than taking, you know, an hour long bus ride versus a 25 minute car ride. Um, and then we're seeing just overall changes to the number of employees in the office having effects on the ability to van pool and ride share. There's less you know, community with between the employees and there's less ability for them to coalesce around a specific time or day to share a ride. Um, as we think about employee commuting going forward, it really needs to be changed kind of on its head. It has to look at affordable transportation options across the board, um, focus on off-peak work schedules and hybrid work schedules. So it is not just that six to nine window and it is not Monday through Friday, but really when people need it. Um, the programs need to be tailored to those who are price sensitive and have challenging commutes. As we know, many cities are going through large transit 
um, service reimaginings and that is having lots of effects, often positive in communities that were underserved, but also challenging in some places where there were good commuting lines that have been reduced or changed. So just making sure we're balancing the, the trip demand between the people that are needing it the most and using it the most and also solving the issues of congestion on key thoroughfares. Um, and then lastly, we really need to start talking about how we travel as a health outcome, um, both for ourselves, for our community and for the climate. But I think that story is becoming stronger when in the past it was really about time and money. I think we have the ability to really change that story, especially coming out of the pandemic with like thinking about community health um, and helping people understand the costs and benefits in that in that way versus just the, the hours and time. Um, so the new commute programs have to adjust. They need to focus on affordable and convenient options, be flexible, be coordinated. This is an important thing we'll talk about in a second. And technology is our friend. We really want to use that going forward to really help people um, make fast and efficient decisions and give us the data that we need to really refine our programming to make it the most useful. Uh, okay, new commute programs. So a lot of these are not really new commute programs. It's just mostly in the way that they would be presented to employees or other users. So daily parking has been a mainstay of PDM for years. It really helps people have that pay for it when you need it and make a daily decision freedom. Um, I think we'll see a, a big increase in this, even in some of the more rural areas, just as folks are realizing that they don't need the monthly rate to get the benefit of parking. Um, same goes with any sort of subsidy or free access for transit, ride hill services, bike maintenance, et cetera. Those used to be kind of like buy in bulk, a monthly pass, an annual pass. But again, as we're seeing folks commuting less frequently or in different time periods that may have different fares, um, I think those, those, those subsidies will be changing kind of in response to both the program budget and the user to make sure they're more valuable. For instance, if we have a hospital and a lot of people are using the ride hail in lieu of transit late at night, perhaps this is a surge pricing time, so maybe they need a higher amount in that subsidy. Um, but just more food for thought as we get into this and think about how the benefits really work for people um, in the new kind of landscape. Additionally, incentives are, will continue to be a really useful way to, in, to get people to choose non-SOV trips. Um, I think the, the caveat here is in the past there would be like, I signed up for a monthly carpool program. Now those are really by trip. Um, so we want to have a way to really say like, I did this thing on this day and I'm getting rewarded for this behavior versus kind of these blanket ideas because they're just not the same anymore. Um, and then mobility walls and mobility, mobility as a service are really new and upcoming ideas and really can help serve that flexible and affordable piece for a lot of people, um, giving folks a variety of subsidies, a really easy way to make decisions and a really easy way to see the cost benefit of all the, the modes. Um, hasn't been done a lot. This graphic is from Portland, which has done it really well. Um, but I think we're going to start to see more interest in those and more development of those services in the U.S. as we go forward. Um, a highlight is Oregon Health Science University in Portland, who through the pandemic implemented wage-based daily parking. Um, they obviously had a lot of frontline workers on site during the pandemic. They started with free parking and they moved into a reduced daily rate and then they moved into wage-based. Um, they had a, a really long TDM plan goal of moving from annual permits to daily parking. And then the move further to wage-based was really kind of the icing on the cake. They were able to give folks who hadn't been able to park, one, the opportunity to park, and two, the opportunity to park at a rate that was comfortable within their salary from OHSU. So you can see from pre-COVID to February, a year after COVID, we'll call that in the middle of COVID, um, they did see an extreme decrease in annual permits. Um, and then on the next slide, we'll see how much the percentage of ways, wage decreased as they implemented the wage-based daily parking. So for folks that are being paid less at OHSU, that percentage of their daily wage dedicated to parking was significantly higher pre-COVID, um, and they were able to cap it in a really nice way, directly tied to their compensation from the hospital or university, depending on what you do. Um, next thing we want to talk about is creating the best commute. So again, this is really tailoring those programs to the employee and the day that they're deciding to come into campus. In the past, we had the question of, how would I get to work on a daily basis? And now it's really if you're going to commute into the office. And I think that is something we all need to get really comfortable with and continue to support. Um, one thing I've learned from my work with a couple large employers in the Puget Sound is that while people want flexibility, they still really want to understand like what their options are and know them inside and out. So you don't want to get stuck waiting for a bus that you're not sure your connection times, you're not sure when 
it's coming, you're not sure where it's going to drop you off. So they really want to learn educa like the education for these months at a much higher level. There's a little bit less flexibility in the, the time it's taking them to do these things because they have other options and the option of not coming to the office. Um, coordination across offices and types of groups is really key. Um, often these are discussed at kind of the team level or the office level, you know, decisions based on when folks are coming in or not coming to the office, really it is much bigger than that. It is a conversation between the property manager, the facilities team, the commute team, any other on-site services. Um, sometimes even if you're working in a big building, it could be with other tenants in the building to just make sure you're not overwhelming the infrastructure that you do have or the services you do have at any moment in time. Um, I think this is still learning for a lot of large companies, both in the Puget Sound and outside, where some things just kind of happen in a silo, but you're seeing ripple effects in capacities for shuttles or parking or limits to food service abilities when folks are all on site. And so it really needs to be a broader conversation so everyone can work together as a community to really make sure that they're meeting the expectations of the employees and the employers. I'm almost done, I promise. Um, and the last thing is technology. Um, using technology to create habits is really useful. And then even better is habits that can produce data that employee commute coordinators can use to refine their programming and understand the peaks and valleys of when folks are using them and coming to the office um, or opting for other types of trips. So this could take a variety of forms, rideshare applications, parking reservations, trip logging, desking, conference room booking, et cetera. Um, but the case study I want to highlight is Expedia. Um, prior to the pandemic, they had a really high sample in carpool mode shares. They used a scoop carpool app. Obviously, that decreased significantly during the pandemic. They did kind of a ease back into commuting with some free parking and a lot of other amenities, and then leaned really hard into ride to our summer 2022, where they launched Lift Tango, which is a really dynamic way to carpool next within the company itself. Um, they have a pretty good adoption rate, but they're running into a lot of the same problems that I discussed previously, not enough employees on site on the days that everyone wants to be commuting, so limited matches. Um, but it does allow people that on the fly decision, there's not these stagnant month long carpool partnerships, they are able to meet more people in their neighborhoods and at their company. And then my takeaway is really to just unexpect, expect the unexpected. We're still seeing off, return to office plans and kind of what the essential worker is defined as changing on a daily basis or a monthly basis. Um, we're seeing demands for transit change frequently. We're seeing congestion change frequently on the roadways. Um, I mentioned that employees are looking for flexibility and consistency, which is a hard thing to tackle with some of the transit changes, as I mentioned, um, or other kind of relate relations to density of employees. And then there are lots of continued stressors for folks. So childcare shortages, reduced transit service, increasing congestion, inflation, these are all going to continue to impact behaviors as we go forward. So it's learning how to pivot in a much more dynamic way than we all had been doing prior to the pandemic. And I think Tim Tim is going next. I'll pass it to her. I think it's Jessica. Oh, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> this is uh, Brock. It, it is Tim Tim is next. Oh, it is me. Uh, oh, okay. And uh, let me do a quick yeah. intro <laughs> of you. And um, I should probably, as we do this, have my own spotlight. Uh, so. Um, next to present is Tim Tim Chan. Tim Tim is a principal of Nelson Nygaard, where she specializes in TDM, parking, and all things multimodal. Prior to Nelson Nygaard, Tim Tim worked at the MBTA in Boston and at the city of Austin, where she established the city's first TDM program. She serves as uh, co chair of the Transportation Research Board's Committee on TDM. And you can take it away now, Tim Tim. Great. Thanks, Brock. Um, let's see. Is it working? It is working and we are okay. seeing the, right. the yeah, the PDF. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's perfect. Um, well, first off, thank you, Brock, for bringing us together. This is really fun. I think this is a great way to spend a Friday. Um, Melanie, oh my gosh, so much information, so much good content. I hope people were taking notes because <laughs> that was, um, a barrage of information. Um, so uh, for my presentation, I wanted to make sure um, to provide something separate from what Melanie and Jessica um, will present and focus on a little bit of a wonkier topic, 
which is talking about um, progressive TDM and parking policies through the lens of uh, two example cities, Atlanta and St. Paul. Um, so I thought this would be interesting because we are seeing so many cities removing parking requirements citywide, like St. Paul, Minnesota, like San Jose, California, um, and cities are also really focusing on implementing developer TDM requirements through zoning, through ordinances and other means. Um, and just as an example of how much we're seeing this across the country, right now I'm working on a new TDM ordinance for the city of San Mateo in California, um, updating an overlay district in Lexington, Massachusetts to increase developer um, TDM requirements, um, working with a downtown district in Providence, Rhode Island to strengthen their developer TDM requirements and also um, create their parking and curb policies. Uh, so all to say this is a wonky topic, but it's so cool to see this trend um, throughout the US and uh, excited to share with you all. Um, so first off, just setting the stage, I wanted to set the stage on how Nelson Nygaard crossed paths with these two cities, Atlanta and St. Paul. So as part of the uh, this big project called the American Cities Climate Challenge uh, that started a couple years ago, um, we were hired to provide technical support to 16 cities across the US that had identified specific transportation needs. So those included St. Paul and Atlanta, um, as well as Austin while I was still um, working at the city's DOT. Um, and so as part of this work, besides providing specific TDM guidance to these cities, uh, it also created this really great resource, which is up on the screen, the new transportation demand management and implementation guide, um, which you can find online. And I also have linked at the uh, end of the presentation. Um, for me, as a former city employee trying to build up a TDM program, this was exactly the kind of resource and guidance that I had wanted. Um, just some really valuable things in there, including uh, really good examples from cities all across the country on TDM best practices. And also, be, besides just highlighting case studies, the guide um, dives into specific TDM strategies, how to get started, highlighting the key components um, without getting too much into the weeds when it starts to become really city or context specific. Um, uh, so today we are going to deep dive into TDM developer requirements for these two cities. And we're gonna touch upon um, each of these topics and asking the questions of what sort of engagement did these cities do to prepare for these new policies? How did they develop the framework? How did they set up a monitoring plan, if any? Um, and what are the is their future vision for, for strengthening these TDM policies? So where are they now? So the city of Atlanta um, has a citywide TDM strategic plan, and then recently updated their zoning requirements to include TDM and new developments, although it is only focused on um, specific business districts. And then most recently, they lowered their parking maximums in these districts. So this is um, really exciting, more recent news. Um, uh, St. Paul, they eliminated um, minimum parking requirements citywide, and at the same time, it did a full reform of their TDM um, developer requirements. Uh, and so engagement, um, how did they utilize engagement during these TDM policy processes? Um, Atlanta, short story, um, they kept it super non-controversial because it was focused on business districts. They did very limited engagement. So there's not much to touch upon here, but um, a pretty opposite story when it comes to St. Paul. So St. Paul um, during that time was really focused on um, selling the story about parking minimums. So they did a lot of engagement. Um, they were trying really hard to tell the story about parking that could actually connect with the audience without the audience's eyes glazing over. Um, and so these storybook presentations were really critical 
in getting buy-in from the community. Um, the education and outreach really focused on framing why parking minimums are a problem and specifically for whom. Um, and so these icons look familiar because Nelson Nygaard um, worked with St. Paul to do the storybook telling. Uh, we created personas to tell the story from each of these people's lenses. Uh, and so a couple examples. So there is a developer, Danielle, and they tell the story about how a third of families that need affordable housing don't own a car, but de developer Danielle um, has her hands tied and has to build parking when she um, builds her housing, even though she knows that that's going to increase rent and that uh, a lot of that parking is gonna go unused. And so with continuing the story without parking minimum requirements, developer Danielle could build more homes, more affordably priced and with less parking. Um, and then another example, uh, shopkeeper Shauna um, is starting to see these trends and really wants to um, utilize her parking and convert it into a patio. But her hands are tied as well because she has parking minimums that she needs to meet. Um, so just really great storytelling that I, I really uh, appreciated um, and really worked with St. Paul. Um, so framework. So now let's dive into the nitty gritty about what these TDM policies mean. Atlanta, I really like this example because they framed it in a really clear and easy for the developer to understand way. They only had three different land uses, office, hotel, and residential. And they basically said, if you're a project, you have to meet these four or six different elements. And then beyond that, you need to choose a few from these other categories that are a little more aggressive, like parking pricing, um, directly investing in transit, unbundling parking, things like that. So um, this uh, strategy or like this kind of TDM policy is really transparent and developers really like kind of that approach. St. Paul is a little different. They uh, emulated their TDM policies uh, with San Francisco. So San Francisco was the first to do this elaborate point system. So similarly, St. Paul has a long list of TDM strategies that are each given a point value generally based on how effective the strategy is on reducing vehicle miles traveled. And then um, the developments in St. Paul are given a point target based on where they are located, how close they are to transit and their um, proposed parking ratios. And then the developers choose from that menu, combine it all to get to their um, point target. Uh, and then moving on to monitoring. So um, this one is interesting. And uh, I, I think a, a, a general comment is that monitoring is incredibly hard. And uh, we see this in cities all over the US. Um, Atlanta is no different. They do have monitoring requirements um, in their policy, although they uh, very clearly transparently admit that they are not doing any of it. Um, and the most obvious one is because they just don't have enough staffing. Um, but there are other also um, contributing factors, including that the city just, the city as kind of internal stakeholders and internal staff just have not yet bought into the idea of transportation demand management, and they still have a little ways to go to really buy in and support this program. Um, and then there's kind of just like lack of clarity on who is responsible. Um, St. Paul is a bit more aggressive where they require TDM coordinators for their projects, so it will become a lot easier to monitor. Uh, but the interesting thing is they don't require monitoring until two years after the project's uh, certificate of occupancy. So it is yet to be determined if um, their monitoring works because they it's they're in a wait and see um, period uh, when those projects start. Um, hitting that two year mark. Uh, and then lastly, strengthening. 
So um, Atlanta, moving forward, they really want to focus on building internal staff capacity so that they can actually implement and monitor. Uh, they also want to just strengthen their internal TDM program within the city so that um, them as a city feel like they are walking the walk and not just uh, applying policies and regulations to uh, other folks. Um, they also are hopeful that they can expand these requirements beyond their existing uh, business districts. Um, St. Paul, um, th similarly, they are hoping to strengthen those targets, point targets, basically raise those target requirements. Uh, they're also hoping to add more requirements such as requiring transit passes for certain um, projects. Uh, and similar to um, what Atlanta did re recently, they want to continue to uh, lower their parking maximums. Uh, and I've hit the end. And I think I talked really quickly, so hopefully we're, we're still on track. Uh, I'm going to leave this up here just for a few seconds so people can screenshot if they're curious um, to find these resources later on. Uh, but I assume you could also ask Brock for um, the slide deck. And here is my contact information if you have any questions and want to talk wonky stuff, I always welcome it. Thank you so much, Tim Tim. That was fantastic. Uh, our final presenter is Jessica Roberts. Jessica is principal of Alta Planning and Design, where she manages programs and projects across the country that help people drive less often and walk and bike more often. She specializes in education, promotion, and marketing programs, safe routes to school programs, and TDM. Uh, take it away, Jessica. Thank you. Stop the other screen sharing because I'm real rude like that. Okay, you can see this big blue slide, yeah? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, my team, un unlike a lot of what uh, Tim Tim and Melanie do, my team actually does the implementation of campaigns. So we work directly with the traveling public to change their behavior. And um, I'm here to talk about a specific campaign we got to do in West Seattle over the last year and a half, I guess. Well, we ended in December. Um, called Flip Your Trip West Seattle. And what I'm going to focus on, it was a big program that had a lot of elements, but specifically the angle that I'm bringing um, that complements, we hope what you've heard already, is first off that this is community-based TDM as opposed to employer-based TDM. And secondly, I'm going to focus on the equity aspects of this project. So I'm not gonna tell you everything about it. I've only got, oh yeah, I gotta start my timer. Synchronize watches, okay. Um, 10 minutes, go. So you can get the highlights. All right, so uh, many of you, since you're in the region, probably remember back in early 2020, the West Seattle Bridge, they were uh, circled in red, which was the main way on and off of the West Seattle Peninsula. There had 100,000 daily auto trips. Uh, overnight got closed because they found cracks uh, that were um, uh, catastrophic. They, they, the bridge could not safely be driven on. Um, so overnight, uh, 80,000 plus households no longer had the main way on and off the peninsula. Uh, this was a problem for mobility. <clears throat> and this is showing the West Seattle Peninsula. You can see the, the blue route is the, the line is the water taxi, which remained and more service was added. The green route is transit, which remained because the low bridge was unaffected and, and transit was able to use the low bridge. But the orange route is the auto detour. And that was where if all those 100,000 trips um, had persisted, they would all have had to drive quite far south. And it's not like that bridge wasn't routed already. So uh, that's a problem for many reasons, economic mobility, um, other kinds of mobility, you know, people being able to get to their jobs, all of those things. It's also a really big equity problem because if you look at the right side, you'll see the darker blue basically means higher um, 
identify disadvantage. I, I don't have the time to go into exactly how F dot defines disadvantage, but you know, race, income, English proficiency, they have a really thoughtful framework. So I um, just trust that the dark blue is based on evidence-based factors. But as you can see, basically what we're doing is routing more affluent people through less affluent neighborhoods for the detour route. So serious quality of life impacts, um, congestion, you know, really bad for uh, those businesses. Those people also, um, you know, lower income folks during the pandemic were much, much, much less likely to be allowed to work from home, be able to work from home. So then if you suddenly actually have to drive to your job because you have no other option, and then there's 100,000 trips that are making it impossible for you to do that, that's, that's anyway, lots of big equity problems with this situation. SDOT through a lot of um, spaghetti at the wall to try to make it work, including buying more transit service, um, doing some really quick response infrastructure improvements. Um, well, they enhance water taxi as well. So, so both bus transit as well as water taxi service and they brought micro mobility, shared e-scooters to the area. That said, uh, we all still needed fewer people to drive and hitting that directly through a campaign model just makes sense. However, if you think back to the, the taste I gave you about some of the like equity concerns that already existed and were exacerbated through the bridge closure, you can imagine that if you simply tell people who have experienced you know, higher structural racism, who may have um, area, they live in areas that have been systematically disinvested in over many decades, you just tell them, hey, don't drive. What might they say reasonably? They might say, um, my, the school closed and I don't have daycare. Um, I, I, I don't have time to take my kids on a bus to somewhere else, or um, maybe people who have language barriers, understanding other ways to get around, maybe they have uh, personal experience or very well-grounded fears in, let's say, race-based harassment or uh, enforcement profiling. So simply saying, hey, everybody drive less wasn't, mm, wasn't what SDOT felt was fair or equitable. So they have a really robust racial equity framework plan, set of practices. Coming out of that were some specific goals for, for our effort for, for this campaign that we were designing related to equity. And that was decreasing the safety and health risks that went along with the detour route externalities for these disadvantaged neighborhoods. Focusing on providing affordable and accessible options, particularly to those same areas. And, and no matter where they live, the people who needed it most, Emphasizing economic mobility and investment, and that included things like, for example, if we were going to procure some kind of service or good, trying to do it from a West Seattle business, if at all possible, making sure that that money was being spent supporting that place, and focusing on, uh, particularly focusing on access and strategies for BIPOC, so Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and vulnerable communities in this area in our program design tactics partnerships. So that led to these program goals, uh, the official ones for the for the entire program, and it was reducing drive alone travel in and out of the peninsula, encouraging, supporting, and increasing the use of transportation options, both um, in and out, as well as within the peninsula, and supporting communities that were impacted by the detour through mobility subsidies and support. And the result was the Flip Your Trip campaign. It ran, well, our work started in June, 2021 and ended in December, 2022. The public phase was a bit shorter. You need some time to ramp up and you need some time to evaluate, but basically a year and a half and we ended up with 9,000 registered participants. The Flip Your Trip brand and Sal, the spokes salmon had already existed. SDOT had invested in this brand, uh, the branding and the brand visibility for other TDM work in the past. Sal is a snarky, foul-mouthed, hilarious, and Seattleites love her. And not only did we use her image and we had her, so she's, she's the salmon in case I didn't make that clear. Um, uh, she was, was featured in a lot of our videos, but also her puppeteer is amazing and comes with us live to events and on the spot voices Sal, like has conversations as Sal about TDM and mobility with people who engage with her, which is a very high level of sophistication. I never in my life thought that my job would involve like regularly working with a salmon puppet, but here we are. But I mean, people like they want to sell selfies. It's a big attractant. So uh, love that. Very grateful to ask Dot for giving us that. 
Um, anyway, uh, communication, uh, everything we did was fully in nine languages, Eng English plus uh, eight other languages. And that was all material, all materials translated into that. And then we would bring live interpreters on, well, for all of the webinars, as well as any of the events where we found out that someone might reasonably need that language interpretation. Our overall communication strategies, as you can see, we did direct mail. Estet already had a 9,000 person West Seattle bridge closure email list and some other email lists, as well as there were community email lists that you know, pushed information out for us. Obviously, our media press releases. We had many partners, such as the West Seattle blog, which is the place you get your news on in West Seattle and things like that. We did a ton of geotargeted social digital and really sophisticated targeting from our media buyers that I don't have time to go into, but I am such a fan of what you can do with smart media buyers. And we did a lot of Spanish language radio ads. Uh, this is just my slide telling you why I love direct mail and I'm a huge fan of it. Um, those were the postcards. We sent post two rounds of postcards each to 66,000 households and those were signups um, uh, in response. So, and, and we did a lot of other things too and they were all important, but um, direct, don't let anybody tell you that direct mail is dead. And I think it's really democratic, you know, from an equity perspective, it arrives at every single person's door. The incentives we had, well, they were mobility subsidies, really. We, so King County Metro, the regional transit agency, had already invested in adding a functionality to their mobile ticketing app that allowed for um, rewards and sort of earning, earning points. Those points can only be spent on mobility, such as transit fare, water taxi fare, or micromobility. So we got to actually be the soft launch of it. And we gave the sign up bonus was $25 in free rides. Uh, and then once they were in, we had all sorts of interesting ongoing campaigns that were based on, you know, the, the weather or new service or some, some angle. Um, so we could, you know, earn double points if you do this or try this for the first time and get a bonus. So we could do that throughout. But of course, from an equity perspective, you know, not everyone can make this work. They might not have internet access. They might not have a phone. They much might just not be digitally literate enough. So no questions asked. We also just sent people a $25 ORCA card upon request. Uh, ORCA card is the combined um, fare card for the region. For outreach, we did a lot of tabling. Classic, it's classic for a reason. And so it had existing events, um, often with style. And we did 29 of those. We did some custom events. Uh, such as we did a big uh, e-scooter e demo day. It was very popular and we did some online events. These were mostly educational. And then um, we also had a lot of work that we did with community-based organizations. And most of them were selected specifically because they were organized by and intended to serve either BIPOC populations and or one of our partners was LGBTQ plus serving. So in you know all of us, I think in our work, many of us, I'm sorry, some of you maybe as ETCs, this might not be so relevant, but a lot of us who work in any kind of public agency or, or outreach context uh, do a lot of work with community-based organizations these days and know that they already have the credibility, the infrastructure, the cultural um, context um, to reach exactly who we want to reach. So in working with them, we wanted to um, first of all, treat them fairly and, and compensate them for their contributions. That was really important. <clears throat> the city of Seattle, not even SDOT, the city of Seattle, also their department of neighborhoods had been working for a long time to create positive, clear, um, respectful working relationships with these organizations. And they didn't want us coming and sort of getting in the way with that. So they made sure that we went through their liaisons, their existing liaisons to these organizations to um, to propose a working model. And then we defined three tiers of engagement with different levels of compensation. One was an information partner. So just send out the stuff we send you at regular intervals. The next was an event partner. Invite us to one or more events that you are already hosting. And the third was a collaborative partner. Let's co-create um, a new event type for your audience. They could pick whatever they wanted. We ended up working with 10 partners. We did nine custom events. So for example, there was pop-up bike repair and bike giveaways. It was free bike repair in neighborhoods that didn't have bike shops. Uh, Black Girls Do Ride did a group ride that uh, featured lunch at a local BIPOC owned business and, um, and a Black musician actually came. And 
uh, Peace Peloton already organizes rides to support black owned businesses, bike rides. And, and so we partnered with them as just some examples. Uh, and you can see the bike did um, a really cool um, pride ride as well. Um, yeah, I had to cut myself off because my timer just went. Um, so there's so much more we could talk about about that program, but I hope that gives you some sense of how bringing a really strong equity lens to community TDM, you know, uh, some of the options there. I can give you back your screen, although this picture cracks me up. But bye, Sal. Uh, Sal is a is amazing. Um, his voice is I don't know New Jersey or the Bronx or something, uh, and it's just very snarky, very fun. Yeah, she's genuinely hilarious. Yeah. And it was fun to meet uh, Sal in person as well uh, with the puppeteer. Uh, so let me get everybody spotlighted here. Great. So those were three great, inspiring presentations. And I'm sure many of the folks in the audience have questions for Melanie and Tim Tim and Jessica. Uh, I would like to open it up. If you have questions, feel free to raise your hand uh, and then come on screen. Um, I will kick us off with a kind of a generic question, um, which is uh, we're trying to accomplish a lot of things with TDM. Um, potentially, uh, and we've seen some different use cases uh, from your presentations, from managing congestion, reducing vehicle miles traveled, addressing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, just increasing transportation choice. Um, how does the decision of what to prioritize there affect programming? And anybody can take up the question if you'd like. Um, oh man. Well, I, I think that is a tough question because it depends on the project and it depends on what the purpose and goals are. Um, I would say it is always a difficult um, task to prioritize, but it makes it a lot easier if part of either the project effort or the client, the community, the city is already uh, clear on their goals and vision uh, for either the organization or you know, the city, whether it's like a citywide transportation plan or a specific campaign, um, or I guess uh, employer too, I'm trying to We've got all these like different, the three of us are like representing different groups. Um, I think this, to me, Brock, this gets to um, maybe another question that you're gonna talk about too, is uh, what are the appropriate metrics when we think about success in TDM and uh, Jessica touched upon the equity conversation a lot, and I do think that that is something um, me and Melanie work together a lot, and we're working on several countywide transportation demand management plans, and that conversation of how, how do we reflect back on um, how we've prioritized projects in the past? Um, a lot of it is this historical focusing on either vehicle trips or VMT and uh, air quality mitigation. How do we reflect back on that and also look forward with this equity lens that I think the pandemic and a lot of recent um, events have kind of put in the forefront of the transportation and TDM industry specifically. Um, and so I think I don't think I'm answering the question, but I think I'm posing that uh, the prioritization I think is a changing process and very very dependent on who you are trying to serve and what the intent of the project is. 
and maybe I can answer more specifically, but that was kind of like my first. That's, that's a good. Brain, um, brain fuzz. Good <laughs> opening as well to get people thinking. Uh, Sherman has, a, has his hand raised and Sherman, feel free to come on camera and ask your question. <clears throat> Hello, sorry, y'all. You see the a silhouette of me and the sun's behind my <laughs> uh, We're just assuming you're on one of those TV shows with the sort of witness protection. Like. <laughs> I don't want to go back and close the shades, but um, my questions is, I've got a couple real quick ones. Um, the wage-based um, uh, pricing, that was interesting. I never heard of that before. So thanks for introducing that, Melanie. I've, and all of you, great presentations, by the way. But I was wondering, like, how um, did that apply to carpools as well? And and if they did, like, whose whose wage was that based on then at the end of the day? Because I'm like, maybe when a carpool, we're going to use your wage because yours is the cheaper wage. And then before you answer that, I'll just ask the second question, too. And it was more about CTR. I didn't hear a lot about CTR here, but... Um, my question about that, and I don't know who can answer that one, is is when with uh, telecommuting as a kind of a almost a standard now for everybody and every business, does that count as a participating means of travel mode when you are calculating that you know uh, that travel that that percentage of participation because that's going to be ultimately how the CTR program works. Thanks. Yeah, so I'll start with the wage-based parking. Um, OHSU is the first and only organization I know of to do that, um, which is amazing. And it is implemented through the Loom system. Um, I don't know if folks are familiar, but it's essentially a commute transportation platform. It does a lot of benefits management, trip logging, parking reservations, parking infrastructure, um, controls of gate arms and things. So they worked really closely with them to, OHSC worked very closely with Loom to set up this system tied to some human resources data to make sure that these parking brackets were associated and working at all of the available garages that had the infrastructure. Carpool is definitely a thing they still struggle with. They don't have, um, the Loom functionality only goes so far. Um, and they, OHSU has some conflicting programming where they're not always able to have the wage-based parking work as well with the carpool trips because there's some just like technical details associated. So that is actually, they just refresh their TDM plan um, to look at the next five years and carpooling is something that they're prioritizing both to increase carpool trips because um, it, as I mentioned, is kind of a dwindling mode share with just the change in schedules for folks that were doing that previously. Um, but that very thing that you're bringing up is there's the discrepancy of whose wage that would be based on and then the technical aspects of how that gets implemented to the Loom system. So it is not, it is not easily solved and not solved yet, but high priority for them in the upcoming years. Um, and I will answer CTR to the best of my knowledge and Brock, I'll let you as well. Um, I also oversee the commute program for Expedia, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. I've been there since 2016 um, and kind of brought it up from the base of no program or just parking versus transit to what it is today um, and oversaw their move from Bellevue to Inner Bay. And so I'm intimately aware of the CTR surveying um, requirements. And this last round we did in October of 2022 and telecommute was definitely uh, included mode share. Um, it was higher than it has ever been, and I'm sure will continue to be so. And I have not heard any forthcoming changes to make it not an included mode in the surveying evaluation. Yeah, that, that's correct. Telecommuting is a way that you can reach your um, your goals as a company um, to for your drive alone rate being reduced. I think the moving forward will be interesting how that gets included within the data because the commuters that are that you look at are those who are arriving between 6 and 9 a.m. And as we go to alternative scheduling, um, employers may think about the time of day effects. If I was an employer, I would say everybody who's telecommuting is definitely showing up between 6 and 9, uh, <laughs> just so your drive alone rate would be reduced. Um, <laughs> certainly. Uh, well, it's definitely survey sure. data, so it's yeah, based on employee right. responses, yeah. and that does include the start of your workday. Um, so there's only so much you can kind of control as an employer. Yeah. Okay, um, thanks. 
that gets maybe to, um, I have maybe two more questions if, if folks don't have them in the chat or raise their hands. Uh, so uh, with the pandemic, you know, we have seen the drive alone rate really increase. And so total, or sorry, the telecommuting rate has really increased. So the drive alone rate has dropped to 62%, something we never would have imagined in the state um, to drop that far. And so it looks like as a state, we're looking to have a goal of 60% um, drive alone rate, which is um, quite low. Um, as people, as workers transition back to the workplace, what's different in a TDM program or in a CTR program to making sure that the people who are, you know, we maintain the existing drive alone rate, right? It's a little bit different than when typically we were just hiring. There's just natural turnover towards employees, and you would hope the next turnover would mean the new employee would make the choice not to, to drive. Uh, but in this situation, uh, existing employees haven't been going to work, and now they might be returning to the workplace. So how is that different in how we think about our CTR and TDM programs? I can definitely speak to this, um, Jessica, unless you want to add anything. Um, in the work that I've been doing most recently, we've been treating all employees as new employees, essentially. Um, rounds and rounds of education related to the modes that are available, information on the changes that have happened to the systems they're used to, one-on-one um, -on -one meetings, targeted marketing, lots of incentives, lots of rewards, just really focused on getting them back to understanding what's happening. Um, early post-pandemic. So, you know, last year around this time, there was a lot of focus on public health education and just like people's comfort level is obviously very different, but helping to be kind of the voice or the sounding board as people have concerns about, you know, riding public transit or taking a bike ride next to someone else in the exchange of COVID. Um, we've seen that decrease significantly as folks are getting more comfortable coming back to the office. And now the conversation is really just about like, oh man, I have to go in. Um, and I think with traffic, I'm speaking particularly to the Puget Sound right now, um, Seattle traffic is back to what it was pre-pandemic and people are not commuting to the same amount. So that means a lot of these other trips for daycare, dentist appointments, et cetera, that perhaps previously would have been rolled into a transit ride um, during your day at the office or something like that are now just standalone drive-alone trips. And I think there's probably a lot of education work to go into that, that perhaps when you are working from home, maybe don't schedule your dentist appointment at 9 a.m. so you're not on the road at the same time as everyone else, or maybe go to the office after that so you can take public transit and trip chain. Um, but I think that is a big piece that we're hearing from employees regionally, that traffic is still really bad and they want other resources, but they don't remember what they are. And so again, just like giving them the option, supporting them in the education has gone so far, so, so, so far in the past year. Fantastic. I'm going to finish with one last question that I think should be a somewhat of a softball, but um, our regional government has prioritized most of Snohomish County's population employment growth to occur within um, our three uh, designated regional growth centers um, in Snohomish County here and near bus rapid transit and light rail stations. And these places, would it make sense for local jurisdictions to take a more proactive approach in requiring development to have TDM plans? and to partner with transportation management associations to implement TDM strategies? Yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> right. Softball question. Definitely a softball question. But yeah, I mean, I think all of us working in TDM know that it is not a silver bullet solution so that we need to think about it from all areas like the topic that Jessica was talking about, Melanie was talking about, I was talking about from all these different lenses are, are definitely needed and it's all interconnected land use, transportation, TDM, all of it, yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, so we have uh, arrived at the end of our bus line here. Um, thank you again, Jessica, Tim Tim and Melanie for an engaging, inspiring conversation. Snowtrack has several exciting events coming up that we hope we'll see all of the audience back at again. So you can register at any of these on our website at ghostnotrack.org slash events. Um, next week, we are partnering with Disability Mobility Initiative, Homage Senior Services, and Snoqualmie Human 
Services in hosting the Universal Design Forum on April 19th and 20th. This two-day event will feature workshops and presentations by the Center for Inclusive Design and Environmental Access, AARP, the Northwest ADA Center, and a panel discussion of our local public works agencies on their ADA transition plans. Then we have four fantastic guest speakers lined up. On May 3rd, we are partnering with Commute Seattle to host Angie Schmidt, author of Right of Way, Race, Class, and the Silent Epidemic of Pedestrian Deaths in America. On May 17th, we are partnering with the Cascade Bicycle Club to host Melissa and Chris Bruntlett, authors of Curbing Traffic, The Human Case for Fewer Cars in Our Lives. On June 1st and 21st, we are partnering with Transportation Choices Coalition as part of Ride Transit Month to host Jarrett Walker, author of Human Transit, How Clear Thinking About Public Transit Can Enrich Our Communities and Our Lives, and Nathan Voss, a King County Metro bus driver and author of The Lines That Make Us Stories from Nathan's Bus. For the first three, we are partnering with APA Puget Sound to provide continuing education credits for certified planners, and we hope to all see you again. Until then, ride happy. <laughs>